Welcome to the Fashion Culture Program. I'm Valerie Steele, and tonight I'm going to be in conversation with Sibylla. Sibylla's been described as the greatest fashion, fashion designer from Spain since Balenciaga. And I think that's really accurate. I mean, she's a very, very exciting fashion designer. And she began in the 80s, and we'll talk about that. And then in the early 90s, she stopped showing collections and only did select clothes for different stores like Barney's and in Japan. Beautiful things, but not so easily available to everybody. So now fashion people are really excited that she's come back and has started having collections and will be having, in fact, a pop-up store in New York. Before we have, the first thing we'll be doing is having a, a short video of about three and a half minutes of um, some of the early fashion shows. And then we'll have images and we'll talk over those. And then we'll show images of the current collection. But I just want to start with one little funny story about when we first were meeting. And I was working on a book about women fashion designers. Do you remember? And I wrote to Sibylla and, and said I wanted to include her in the book and sent her some questions. And I didn't hear back. I wrote to Madrid. And then I had visited Madrid, but she wasn't in her store. And I'd bought a beautiful green raincoat there. So it was a rainy, horrible day in New York. And I was in the subway. And a very elegant woman said to me, I like your coat. And I said, well, it's by this really fantastic Spanish designer, Sibylla. And she said, oh, I'll tell her. I'm her sister-in-law. And I said, well, will you tell her to answer my letter? <laughs> and the next day, I get a lovely phone call from Sibylla. And she said, I was, I was writing answers to your questions. And I said, it's OK, sweetie. We can do it on the phone. <laughs> and then it ended up, we uh, put a picture of one of her looks on the cover of the book. And so I'm just so incredibly pleased that she's showing regularly again and that she agreed to do this very rare and wonderful interview. So, have we got it ready to put the video on?
we can talk, um, this is 1985, 86, so we're in the beginning part. And they're going to keep clicking along, so we do need to get the lights down, please, um, so everybody can see them. In, how did you begin to get into fashion in the 80s? What started you into designing fashion? My, my mother was a designer in New York, but I, I, I never lived the fashion world. She retired and moved to Spain. And I was interested in, in completely different things. But I... Louder, <laughs> yes. But uh, when I was 17, I decided to go to Paris and... Um, Lights down. By set of circumstances, I, I ended up uh, managing to get into Yves Saint Laurent as an, as an apprentice. How could you get into Yves Saint Laurent as an apprentice? Just it total luck. Complete luck, you know, com complete, complete luck. It's, I met someone in the street that was walking in the street in that moment uh, with Anne-Marie Munoz, that yes. was Yves Saint Laurent's right hand. And, uh, So I, I, I wanted to do something very creative, and, and I told her, like, you know, I, I would like to maybe do fashion, and she said, come and see. And I was expecting she would give me a creative job. She put me in the bottom of the bottom of the bottom. But that was, you know, I started uh, in, in the haute couture atelier sewing with the Spanish ladies. You were sewing with the Spanish ladies yeah, in the very couture bad. atelier. But, uh, it was it was great, and then I, I went back to Spain, and I I used to say that in Yves Saint Laurent I learned what I didn't want to do, because at the time I guess I was very I was very young and very judgmental about everything. So when I went back to Spain, I tried to do things in a different way. And, and well, when you when you started designing, the clothes were so striking and. And they were so beautiful and sort of soft and feminine and biomorphic. But that was sort of part of a whole, in a way, you were part of a whole art movement in Spain then, in those post-Franco years, that you were doing fashion, there was film coming out, artists. It was like a whole generation was flourishing. Yeah. It was, it was not so much about a style. I think it was more about playing and having fun with what you were doing. And, and we were all very individualistic, all in our own way, finding our own language. And, and yeah, I, I, there was this playfulness about everything. It was a lot of work and very crazy and risky, but, but we had fun. And, and that's the spirit I would like to see in fashion again. One of the, th yes. One of, one of the things also that you've talked about is how you like designing for women and for, and that you appreciate when women are actually wearing your clothes. Can you talk about how um, your relationship with clients that way? Well, I love women and, and I'm really worried now because I really feel there's an epidemic of women not loving themselves. You know, if you think about it, you know, women, all, all the nut in the stomach before you go into a dressing room and all these women walking around feeling that they're not right. You know, even the youngest brides that come to do a wedding dress to my, even no matter how perfect they are, everybody feels that they're not right. You know, I, imagine a designer in, in the 30s or the 40s, you know, a woman asking, saying, you know, I'm not right. No, a designer has to be able to dress a woman and to make her beautiful no matter how she is. And I, I love to celebrate the woman's body. And I, my clothes is, is very body conscious. And, they do and seem to me very, very sort of sensual and womanly clothes. And they have tremendous tactile value. The feel of the clothes as well as the, the silhouette and the look is very sensual. What's your design process? I mean, how, how do you come up with a, a new collection or a new design? It, it starts in different places. It, it's, it has a lot to do with my own experiences, with what I need, what I want. And, 
And then there's another part that is more uh, creating volumes and fabric and, and playing with them in front of the mirror. So one part starts in a very real, real life, you know, like the sweater I want to wear, the pants I need, the thing, something that I saw in the street, and another part starts in, in more complicated volumes that I keep on working to make more and more wearable. So are you draping them? I mean, do you spend yes. a lot of time working in three-dimensional yes, with I the draw, fabric? I draw very basic volumes and then I work on the pieces, sometimes during years. So I, there's always many process, in the, many pieces being done. You worked with a lot of interesting people like uh, Javier Wallenroth, mm -hmm. the photographer, like that picture. He did. That was the one that was on the cover of my uh, Women of Fashion book. Um, how, did you, how did you meet him? Because a lot of these ones, you'll recognize them by his style, are so striking and have become indelible images of your work. Yes. No, he, was, he was part of the Madrid scene. He was older than me, and I admired him very much. And I, I just looked up at him a lot. And life put us together, and it was fantastic. It was. It was part of the best of my work because we really pushed each other to go further. It was, it was fun. The accessories that you did also, I really, really love. The shoes and the bags. Again, there's something about them. They're so like natural shapes, the hats, everything very much like, like plants and sort of as if they're, they're growing. So beautiful. Huh. Do you, you design the accessories at the same time as the dresses? Yes, yes. I, I, I love designing different kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, you were telling me before about how um, you're now divvying up your archive. You'd collected an amazing archive of your work over the, all the time you've been creating. Um, what made you decide at this point that you were going to start giving your archive to different museums? Well, it's it's been... I was counting like more than 30 years of work, so it, so it, that's a lot of clothes. That we've been <laughs> and uh, we moved to a smaller place, and uh, I'm starting in a new period in, in, in fashion, I guess. So I think it, it, it feels right. No, well, I, I actually I came back to fashion very much because Olivier Sayard, the director of the Museum of Fashion in Paris. Uh, wanted to see my archives, so something strange happened, walking with him through my archives and him making me feel that maybe I still had something to offer and, and one thing led to another and he exposed my work in Paris beautifully and well, it happened. That's, that's so fantastic. Now, I, I know Olivier's been really, really excited about your work and has shown it and is going to be showing it again. And can we talk about that in 2017? It seems like it, yeah. That was just pretty fabulous. So um, as you're going into, well, let me talk a little bit. How has your work changed since 84 to now? I know you moved um, from some of the earlier material, which was very, very playful, to you were doing a lot of really beautiful and sophisticated evening wear. Um, how else has it changed? Well, I feel I learned my job better in a way. You know, the, in the beginning I was, I was going more for the first impression and you know, there were very much, we were doing these fashion shows, so it was very much about creating an impression. As years evolved and I grew older, it was very much also about giving women pieces that would really work for them, you know, mm -hmm. that they would give them strength and joy and light and that would be beautiful and functional. So it was very much like, well, like what you're wearing, you know, it, this has a lot of research in the pattern, but at the same time it's simple and it's light and it's easy. So I think I tried to, to be more subtle and mm -hmm. more effective, more, more useful to women mm -hmm. in a way, not so much for the front page of the magazine, more to make women happy. That's what I think is my job. And, and yet, because of the, your treatment of 
volume and the way things float and move, there's something that's also very dramatic and very spectacular about a lot of your clothes. I mean, I remember when I saw this on the rack in your studio, because I had been in Spain last spring and I missed Sibylla's pop-up store in Spain. So then I went to the studio and there were a few things which hadn't sold and so I was just gravitated towards them. Uh, we'll talk soon because she's going to be doing a pop-up store here in New York also, very soon. Um, let's just see, with some of the shapes here, these are, can you talk a little bit about how you created some of these? Well, that was something we did with transparent thread that I think Alexander Wang did like two seasons or two years ago. I don't know, mm -hmm. like Reese, someone told me. That, these well, this was an invitation 2000? of the party in Paris. That was a great, a great party, <laughs> that was last fashion show. Well, these were different techniques. It was, the collections were huge. I still tend to do very big collections and, and I don't really know how to edit myself. And I, <laughs> and I do a lot opposite. So if I do something very fluid, I have to do something very rigid. If I do something very round, I want to make something very square. So they end up being big. Have you ever done anything for dancers? Any yes, dance costumes? Yes, I've done several ballets. Yes, I love that. Yeah. That's, I never occurred to me to ask till I saw that image and I <laughs> thought these would be so perfect for yeah. dancers. Yeah, I've done a few. Now you've done other things in the intermediate years as well as fashion. You did a lot of things for home, and what else? Um, everything. Well, yeah. I've, I've well, I've, I've started doing accessories for home, and and that evolved to be doing homes, and now to be designing communities and and places for people to live. And really, even yeah, so what, landscaping what? and vegetable garden, so it's more and more into life. I say that's the bigger coat we're all wearing, the place mm. where we live. And that's really true. Yeah. That's extraordinary. I know a lot of fashion people get into gardening, but you must be one of the first who's moved into a whole kind of architectural, holistic vision. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's part of my passion. Yeah. But I love doing different things. That's, anything that they propose, I'm, I'm ready to try it. And did you tell me once years ago that you were born in New York? Mm -hmm. But you grew up mostly in Spain I and then in, in Paris? I grew up in Spain, yes. So, um, where do you think Spain is in the, in the sort of global fashion world? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure. I think that there's many young people trying to, to find their way right now. Um, I've been away also for ten, uh, for 10 years, I've been away of fashion in the world. I really mm. don't know much what's going on. I'm, I'm really coming back like if I would be a, a young designer again, like with a lot of innocence and not knowing very much what's going on. Even I, f I feel I've landed again in fashion planet, like <laughs> if I would be from somewhere else and, and I'm looking at everything with fresh eyes, like if, it would, if I would see it for the first time. But this is fabulous because in a way it reminds me so much of how everybody felt about you too at the beginning. Because if you think of the second half of the 80s, it was very aggressive. It was very big, aggressive, hard fashion. And your fashion was so soft and gentle. It was a completely different kind of fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. It was also, I think, also an attitude. They used to call us the gypsies when we arrived in Milan to do the fashion shows. Yeah, we were all in our early, very early 20s and none of us, we were professional. I hadn't studied fashion, no one in my team studied fashion and we were lucky enough to be in the middle of all this, this thing. And they called us the gypsies, I think by the spirit that we brought. We just mm -hmm. brought, and we were doing things the way we thought things had to be done, and very much with the Madrid spirit of that time, that was, you know, you work to enjoy yourself and to make mm -hmm. friends and, and to make things better as you can. So that was very much the spirit. And very different, of course, both from French haute couture and from the Italian kind of manufacturing machine in Italy then, that was really gearing up. Yes, but also 
those elements were also in our work because I was formed in Couture and, yes. and the Italian factory with who I used to work, Gibo at the time, that was very important. They used to say that I was trying to do industrial revolution in the other direction <laughs> going back, but we really managed to, to create some very elaborate uh, pieces uh, in a in more industrial way. Yeah. So, and also, I, I love the process of industry into clothes. You know, I, I, I learned a lot in my years in Italy, and, and I love that, and it's part of my work also. Well, and I think that that means, of course, that you can create for more people than just a tiny handful of people who could do couture. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm very interested also in, in everything that is the, the making of the clothes. You know, who makes it, where it's made, what's the story behind those fabrics. I, I think we also have to use our, our creativity in, in that part of fashion also. You know, fashion creates so much jobs and there's so many people involved all over the world. I, I really believe fashion production could, could be a source of blessings in many places yes. of the world if things would be done in different ways. So yes. I'm, I'm really interested in that part and more now that I'm coming back. Now at the, at the moment, how do you source your fabrics? How do you, where are the clothes made? We're, we're making them in Spain in some small workshops. We've created a, well, a, a hand felt workshop near Madrid and we work with a sm social atelier in the north of Spain. And I'm, we're trying to figure it out. It's not easy, you know, we're, we're going in competing with the most aggressive production in the world right now yeah. and we're trying to make it good quality, good price and time and uh, apply what I believe. So we'll see, we're trying to figure it out. The felt, well, we'll talk about later, but that is such an extraordinary tactile material that you've been working with lately. Yes. But you've always had fantastic materials. Yeah. I mean, I think this is this really, it's like a kind of yeah, silky certainly. paper in a yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. And how it feels. Yeah, and no, I love materials. I'm, I'm obsessed. It strikes me, too, that you've always been an incredible colorist. I mean, I look back and I think of certain, certain things that were just sort of a very rich kind of pumpkin color or an apple green or just very, very beautiful and unusual colors. Yes, yes, I, I, I feel colors nourish you and they have a, a lot of power, so. Ah, oh, that's what you said. I remember now that when I talked to you before, all those years ago, you talked about red. Do you uh -huh. remember that, talking about how you were saying something about in red that you could felt that you could eat the world, that you would just be so, so kind of energized and happy in certain colors that you could take on anything happily, just sort of not aggressively, but just that you had that power there within you. Yeah. Well, I, I use a lot of colors, you know, that, and I think many people have it. Today it's a blue-green day or a green day or a yellow day, and you can use, and you can also use color combinations to create different effects. Yeah. Well, I know some of the, the latest things are very much in that triad, which is the oldest color triad ever, the white, black, red, mm -hmm. which is super ancient and powerful that those three colors together were mm -hmm. used. Yeah, in the, in the new collection, yes. You also have a lot of sort of very body worshiping clothes. I mean, clothes which sort of, not only that you can move in like a dancer, but that will expose sort of unexpected parts of your body, a mm -hmm. lot of things which will tie and loop and back. Um, for you, what's the, the kind of the relationship between the body and the clothes? Oh, I, th I think it's, clothes should be a celebration of the body and of movement. So I'm, in this last collection, I did a whole story about cutouts, trying to find which are the pieces in a woman's body that, is, that are always beautiful, you know, like making little cutouts in little strategic places. And, and I, I try to do clothes that make women feel central and beautiful, no matter what their body or their age is. So I, I play a lot with that, and I try a lot. I, try, I do a dress and I try it like in five different bodies and in different circumstances to see how it looks. Yeah. Fantastic. 
we must be up to, this must be about 2003 yeah. or four. This was yeah, for this Japan, Japan, right? Yeah, this is you Japan. You were doing this collection for Japan. This was in time of accessories in Japan. I never thought that that craziness would arrive to fashion. Accessories, accessories just accessories. taken over, yeah. yeah. Yes. At the time, we used to look at Japanese as they were sick because they were buying Vuitton bags and they wanted logos and they wanted purses. And we thought that here in Europe, we were you know, more sophisticated. And finally, that, that same trend. No, they came were just ahead here. of us there, yes. that it was moving towards yeah. that. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever go back to doing fashion shows, or do you think the fashion show is, as a medium for showing fashion is on its way out? Well, right now I don't feel too much like it, but, but maybe I will. I, uh, I, well, when I show the collection, I've got these wonderful girls that work with me, that, that they're beautiful and they're very real, they're not model-like, and we do these small shows for clients and press. And they were telling me that they're ready to make one of those. Look, seeing the fashion shows that we showed now. Mm -hmm. And in those fashion shows, models really had fun. And it was all about celebrating how different one was from another. Now fashion shows seem to be more about, you know, being more uniform. So maybe one day. Yeah, the, now it's more like robotic clothes hangers. But I noticed in your early fashion shows, there were actresses, and everybody had very distinctive looks and, and sort of personalities. Yeah, and they were very spontaneous. So it was, it was more like playing, but m maybe one day, I don't know. Now, this is so beautiful with the neck and with that particular sleeves. Yeah. Again, there's a very kind of dramatic cut to this, which is so kind yeah. of glamorous and life enhancing. That was coming back now. This was, that was a mother. This is, that is a mother of that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As, as you've evolved as a designer, what have been your sources of inspiration? I mean, are there other designers that you've admired or that you draw on kinds of art or movies or gardens or what are the sources of inspiration? I'm not really sure. It's, it's never very conscious. I, I, everything that I like and everything that I live shows into the collections. Um, but there's nothing very concrete, and I, and I never do, I, I don't prepare a collection in advance, I don't do a mood board, I don't design the, I just start working, and, you know, whenever, like cakes, when they're ready, go next, and then, mm -hmm. and then when the time comes, that's it. And, right. And so, and, and I usually understand where the ideas come in the end when I see it. Yes. Not in the beginning. Well, in a way, it's kind of, the mood board was a great idea in its day, but I kind of feel that it's just become very stereotyped now that people are putting together artificial stories. Mm -hmm. And it sounds this way as though the, the narrative emerges from the process of creation. Yeah, I, I work very much in the pieces, and, and then I kind of create a story in the end, or a story appears that I didn't expect it. Are we stuck on this one? I think that's the, think that's the last one. That's the last one? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I guess we'll go into the next one, which is the current collection. Yes, the, the winter collection. The winter that collection. We're, that we're showing here in New York. Yes. Now, so we have to talk first about when and where can they see this collection. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, we just stopped and opened this beautiful, beautiful store, pop-up store, so it will be only here for two weeks or a bit longer in Mercer Street. I think it's 25 Mercer Street. And, and it will be open as of tomorrow? It will be open tomorrow, yes. At and 10, 11? From You're torturing. <laughs> <laughs> You're from, torturing us. Give us the information. From 10, 10 to 7, 8, I think. And uh, yeah, and there's a new collection. That's so a completely you, different story. You heard it here first. 25 Mercer Street from 10 a.m. to about 7 p.m. 
And in a minute, when they get onto this, we'll show you some of the things that you'll see there in the pop-up store. Yeah, there are many unique pieces, and uh, my girls are there that are fantastic. We have a few. We've had a few technical difficulties tonight, but we're, we're going to surmount those. But I want to wait for a few minutes so you can see the newest collection, and then we can also take questions from the audience. Want to talk to us in advance a little about um, how this particular collection evolved, what are the materials you've been using, and, and how it evolved to you at the, when you finished it, what you felt about this collection? Yeah, well, I. I sold my brand 10 years ago, and uh, I kept on working in Japan, but I kind of dedicated myself to something else. So I've been for five years in the process, the legal process to get it back. And I got it back all of a sudden. Yes. So uh, as soon as I got it, I, I was ready to, to go. So we created the collection very fast, just like a a week after I got back the collection, um, I used to do carpets. The person yes. that, with who I was doing carpets called me to say that a project that I tried to do 10 years ago, she had the artisans to do it. Ah, yes. So I went to her and I started doing the carpets. And the first thing that I did was this very simple carpet, uh, white, black, and red. And that was the beginning also of the clothing collection, so I did it all together, the yes. clothes and the, and the carpets. And the materials that you focused on in particular were? Well, I want to, oh, there we oh. are again. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. No, well, the materials, I, I wanted to do a, a clothes and felt, so we developed these pieces, these, yeah. that they're all, you know, they're all one piece, they, they don't have seams, and they're, and they're made by hand, one by one, and you know, this one, if you open it, it has the same effect inside, and it's a beautiful, beautiful process to do it, and, well, that's, ah. I have to keep on experimenting with this, but it was really fun to, to try something new. I love how you're st showing it here with sneakers, too. Yeah. And then, in this winter collection, there was a whole exercise I tried to play with myself that was uh, the perfect black coat. So there's a lot around the black coat. Everything that... Uh, what I was telling you about the real, the real yes. woman, what real woman needs. So, yes. so many women, I think, would appreciate a black coat that they can wear in, in different circumstances yes. and during many years. So there was a lot around that and there's these beautiful heavy wools or, or very thick jerseys that, mm -hmm. that, you know, follow the shape of your body. This is fabulous. Yeah, that's also, that's, there's no seams, it's all one piece. It's really quite unlike anything that you're seeing anybody else doing. There's no trend that it relates to at all. Mm -hmm. It's coming out of something completely different. Yeah, maybe it's because I haven't been watching too much what's been going on, so. Uh, uh, talk about some of how these coats work, because these oh, are fabulous. Well, this coat, you can wear it, you know, you can, well, you see it for, uh, in another image. If you wear it around, you can really change its shape and it becomes like a sculpture. It's again the same idea. In this collection there's a lot of pieces that you can wear in many different ways and that they transform. So the idea is that the, the clothes follows you. You don't have to adapt to the clothes. Is this the one where you can actually turn it upside yeah, down? Yeah, this one also. There's yes. There's, there's, and, uh, there's so it'll hang differently and drape differently, yes, worn upside down. Yes. Yeah, this one. So this, this, the, the coat before is this one, mm -hmm. and it's different variations. Yeah. 
Sorry, I can't tear myself away from looking at these. Uh, we'll, we'll, you see the lining of the coats was a carpet, so it all started with a carpet this mm -hmm. time. It was just the idea, it was the carpet and the, and the black coat. But that's marvelous with a with a lining like that. I see in the same thing, you know, the black coats that you can wear in different ways. It's the exact opposite of fast fashion. It's really fashion to keep for decades and decades and keep wearing in different ways forever. Yeah, it was like like when refrigerators and washing machines used to last. I would like to do a black coat that lasts. <laughs> yes, you know, that, that's that's the idea. I, I, maybe it's not the most commercial idea, but. That's what I tried to do. And actually, you know, when I came back to fashion, it's so nice to see women coming back and spending money because they feel it was a good investment because yes. they had things for many years and they keep on wearing them. So I think that's the, one of the biggest compliments. No, that's a wonderful feeling if they wear it almost, almost to death and then... <laughs> <laughs> that's Those sleeves are beautiful. How did you do that? white shirt. I just, well, see, that's playing with fabric. Mm -hmm. This is actually a dress and a coat on top. So the, the mm -hmm. coat on top is, is thick jersey. And the dress is made of? It's wool crepe. Wool crepe. Yes, I, I use a lot of wool in, in winter. These are, this is a very simple pant, but it has a quite elaborate uh, cuts, it has no seam on the side, and it's really flattering. I, I like to use a lot of wool, wool in the winter and silk in the summer. There. Now we have a few questions. We've begun to get a few questions, so... Um, first question we have is, do you have any upcoming projects you might want to share with us? I've got many projects coming up. But first of all, figuring out how am I coming back to fashion and what's my place and what's my size and how am I going to do it? Because we don't really have big backing behind. I've started uh, you know, with help of friends and enthusiasm of my team and, and we have to figure out what is our size. Yes. Um, well, and then I'm working in, in these other projects that have to do more uh, with designing communities and houses. That's my passion. Can you obviously. tell a little bit more about that? What does that mean, designing communities and houses? I, if I start, I won't stop. But it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the story goes like when I was doing fashion and I was in, doing these fashion shows, I really felt that there were many things in the world that, that I didn't like how they were going. And I felt, you know, what am I doing here? Going crazy about the length of skirts and the right green or blue. And there are many things, especially after I had my kids. So during these last 10 years, I, I dedicated a lot of time to, to that, you know, to that, those questions. So what's the best way to produce food? What's the best way to create our own energy? Uh, how, what does a healthy house look like? How do you, you can create businesses that are good for the people and good for the world? So we're designing these communities around the world, trying to answer these questions. We call them cool communities because they're CO2 negatives mm -hmm. and, and also because they attract interesting people living there. So. For me, it's a, a design problem, you know, how we live in the world. So, yeah. that's so where are some of the places that these communities exist? Well, there are different ones. Now the, one, the current one we're working on is in the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic. But there's another one in, in Mexico and in Ecuador, and we're working on that. Fantastic. And then I'm doing, we're starting all kind of licenses. Uh, well, as I said, I like to do accessories yes. and home products. And, and food, that's another obsession. So, so well, I hope that idea. the accessory thing with shoes takes off again. I would love yes. to see what you were doing with shoes now. Yeah, but you know, the, the whole industry has changed. You know, when I started doing shoes in Spain, you know, I, all these people that used to do the different process of shoes, shoemaking, 
existed. You know, now most of it has gone to China. So, so big part of my work also has to do with crafts and finding the people that can do things. So that's another project we're doing in Spain. Is uh, during years I've been working on the story of, of the school of crafts in general, and now we're creating a school of crafts for fashion also. Mm -hmm. So that's also that's important. very exciting. Yes. I think that's really re that will that could potentially change the whole process of creating clothes. Yes. If you can try and bring back some kind of craft. Well, there used to be a Spanish tradition of of dressmaking that's been that's been lost. Uh, you know, when I started in fashion, my training really was uh, the the lady that used to do clothes at my my house when I was 10 years old, that she used to do clothes for me. Then when I went to Yves Saint Laurent at 17, uh, half of the workshop were Spanish ladies that taught me. And then when I started my first workshop in Madrid, there were these ladies over 60 that, that taught me everything they knew. I really learned my, my, my job from them. But those women were not valued, and their daughters became architects and psychiatrists right. that eventually were not working and their mother was still mm -hmm. sewing to support them. So I want to bring back all that knowledge that has been lost. Yes, that's really great. Are you inspired by the shapes of Balenciaga's work? Well, I don't know very well Balenciaga's work, and it's strange that I say that. I, I know the way he works, and he works very much creating volumes that I, I do that also. But I, I feel I work more close to the body than him. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I relate more to Vionnet mm -hmm. or, or, or even Gray. I, I feel more I, I work as a woman on a woman. You know, I do clothes on my body. Yeah. I may have something similar to Balenciaga in, in, in the research of shapes and creating yeah. volumes, and I do have that part also. But it's more like the way of working more than the shapes, I think. What's been your biggest challenge in your career? Mm. Being in fashion and being happy at the same time, I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's and I still have to, you know, I've been saying always, I was looking for the happy designer. Where is, because I've seen so many successful designers, but they were very, very unhappy. I was successful very young. I was, I was 21, 22 years old when it, it all became very big, and I didn't really have time to decide if I wanted to be in fashion. And I was, I was blessed, I was very lucky, everybody was giving me what I wanted, but it, it happened too fast. So. At 29, I tried to reinvent my job, and then at 39 again, and trying to figure out how, how do you move in this world mm -hmm. at this speed and do things that you're proud about. And, and the answer usually for me has been my team. My, my team is my strength, and is my treasure, and is my joy, and it's my reason for working every day. So that's, that's what I've found. Thank you so much. Yes. Please join me in thanking Sibylla. Thank you. Um, that was fabulous. What's the price point? <laughs> Might be a thousand dollars for a dress.
world now. And this is our fourth one, I think. And I, I love it. I love to see real women putting on the clothes and different women. And, and that's how I learned my job also. I learn what works and what not. So yes, I'll be there most of the time. <laughs> yes. yes, a lot. I, I, I love using very noble fabrics, but with stretch material. So in, in winter, there's this beautiful stretched wool. And in the summer collection, we also used some incredible materials for that, yes. Yes. Painters? I guess that there are many, but I used to say Milton, Milton Avery is someone that I remember the, the, the first feeling of what colors do. I think that he was someone important in my life. What? Cats? That could be. It could be, maybe, yes. I didn't think about it, but yes, I even had a, yeah, a cat hair, yes. Could be, yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. In department stores? Well, we're not selling in department stores yet. Well, maybe Barney's buys this season. I don't know. We'll, I'll know in one week. But uh, yes, we're coming back. You know, we're producing ourselves, so we have to be very careful. And, to, you know, I haven't, I, I don't have a big industry behind, so we, we're selling to a few stores. And, you know, they used to tell me you cannot be back into fashion if, you know, the first thing, world has changed, you cannot be back into fashion if you don't have a big backing. What I've done with the pop-up is like I kind of go directly to my public, as I say, like, like the musicians. Yeah. I, I... Thank you again so much.